Well, Ryan Taylor, thank you for joining me today. How are you? Doing well. Thank you for having me. Excellent. So you and I have spoken before, uh, but for anybody who hasn't seen that episode, will you kindly give us a brief bio of yourself so we know who Ryan Taylor is and why on earth he was attracted to the Magic Internet Money Dash? <laughs> sure. So um, I have a background in technology and finance. Um, I actually started my career um, with a major company as an enterprise architect um, and got more and more interested in the finance side of the, of the business that, that I was involved with um, and actually ended up uh, pursuing an MBA from Columbia Business School in finance and economics. And then I went and uh, spent seven years doing strategy consulting uh, for mostly financial institutions. Um, spent four years at a hedge fund covering the payment space. So I was researching companies um, for both a, a private equity uh, fund and a public markets fund. So kind of ran the spectrum in terms of size of company that we would invest in um, and became deeply, deeply embedded in the payment space. And uh, that's when I decided to come to Dash. I got exposed to Dash pretty early on in 2014. Um, moved to Arizona for personal reasons in 2014 from New York and uh, I was commuting back and forth to New York for about two years and finally decided last year to, to pull the plug and come join Dash full time and uh, expand on the relationship that Evan and I had, had built over that time. So uh, that's how I ended up here. What was it about the nature of Dash that caused you to take it seriously enough that you that you thought it was an actual contender to enter competitively the, the payment space that you were in at the time? Yeah, so I, I think that if you look at most coins, of course, they're copies and pastes of Bitcoin. They do pretty much everything the exact same way. The thing that attracted me to Dash initially was just the fact that Evan was willing to do something different. Here we had a new algorithm. Uh, we had a, a, a new approach to the tiering of the networks and collateralizing nodes and rewarding infrastructure. These were important aspects. And so I, I, I dipped my toe in the water back in 2014 and bought a master node. And, and played around with it. I wrote a few guides, got involved with the community a little bit. And it wasn't until I moved to Arizona and wrote Evan an email and said, hey, do you want to meet up? And I started sharing some of my views on what the issues were with, uh, with cryptocurrencies and why they just did not line up with what anything within the payments industry would teach us. And he's and he absorbs things very quickly and uh, he uh, very much was receptive to the things that I had to say and the reasoning behind them and so on. And we immediately started brainstorming of ideas that the second tier network could uh, start to address and how they could address them. And um, it was pretty clear that w we could do something really, really different. And so it was that combination of having a leader who who really was receptive to learning about the industry that he's he's basically in along with innovative ideas and figuring out how to do all the things that payments companies do in a decentralized way and so it it's that combination that got me really excited and as progress was made and as um more and more of the ideas that that we brainstormed together would come to fruition it, it started to become something that I just spent all my days, you know, thinking about and excited about. And so at a certain point, uh, I just decided to follow my passion. And uh, and so here I am. And it's, it's been a wonderful experience so far. I, I think, you know, anyone who's looked at the last year um, since I, I've been involved uh, full time, it's been an amazing ride during that those you know eleven months or so that that I've been around in that capacity. So uh, definitely a, a decision I 
I am very happy with. Indeed. So anybody who has seen uh, Ryan's presentation from the North American Bitcoin Conference, I'll post it on the screen now, uh, knows that Ryan got a good deal of attention when he pointed out that within the payments industry that he comes from, uh, no new payment method has seen success unless it ticked at least two of three checkboxes, basically, which is the payment method must be either easier to use, more secure to use, or have some type of incentive or loyalty rewards, like a switching incentive, basically. So with that in mind, I want to ask, so the Dash is, is both the network, is both the payment network and the currency, does that unique combination, does that present any unique challenges going forward that maybe new contenders in the payment space alone don't face? Yeah, I, I think that in many ways it's a challenge. It's also an opportunity. Um, I think that certainly for those of us that live in relatively stable conditions um, and and get to have the benefit of using a relatively stable currency like the euro or the dollar or something like that, it does create some barriers for, for people that want to be able to use a different currency. It's different than the accounting methods that they have to use to run their businesses, um, their personal lives, their bills are all denominated in. And so uh, that is a significant barrier. Um, and uh, I think even within those markets, there's going to be some people, though, that view that as a benefit because they are fearful of the future or fearful of the manner in which central banks uh, and, and governments are, are running up the spending bills and so on. So I think that you'll find that some people will view it as an advantage and some people will view it as a disadvantage. Um, I think that it's an opportunity, particularly in countries where their own currency is very unstable and acquiring uh, stable currencies is difficult and costly. And you see this in a, a variety of different regions of the world where uh, even a currency as volatile as Dash's you know, value is, um, it may be volatile, but it's at least not falling. And so um, in, in many respects, this is a huge upgrade for, for many people in the world. And so I think that you're going to find different receptivity to a new currency in different regions. And Dash and other cryptocurrencies, I think, puts a floor on how bad a central bank or government can be before the people have an option that they can switch to that's much, much better. Um, and so I, I think that we'll see different adoption in different regions for different purposes. I think um, one of the things that, that is really useful about cryptocurrencies is they are nowhere and everywhere at the same time. And so crossing international borders is very easy. So there'll be use cases with remittances, there'll be use cases with um, international payments where it makes a lot of sense regardless of what country you're in. Um, there are other use cases where I imagine some of these uh, poorer and less stable countries will gravitate towards a solution like this over the options that are available to them today. Um, and so I think you'll see different purposes in different regions for, for people to take it up. But I, I, I think that, so, that it is both a challenge and an opportunity. Mm -hmm. That, that makes sense. Those seem to be the two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Uh, in terms of in terms of region specific use cases, like you mentioned, like even country specific use cases, in have you seen other payment methods reach out to specific countries or specific regions in the past? And if so, how did they do that? How how can one reach out to one particular region and say, hey, would you like to try our product? Yeah, it's interesting. There's there's a number of use. There's hundreds, literally hundreds of different payment methods around the world. Most people don't realize it. Um, and many of them are regional or country specific. 
Um, some of the examples that I would point you to is uh, M-Pesa in, in Kenya, where, uh, and it's actually spread across uh, much of the continent at this point. Uh, but it started out as the phone companies noticing that people were using phone minutes and trading them for goods and services. And it was forming a, a form of digital currency that people were using on their mobile devices. And so they uh, saw an opportunity and decided to enable people to transfer money between their phones and, and, and PESA came to be. Um, and it's ubiquitously used um, in many countries in Africa um, for day-to-day -day transactions. And it's another way that the, f the phone company has, has, has uh, a big in, uh, incentive to drive the adoption too, because uh, it, it creates loyalty to the, the, f the phone company as well. And so these mobile devices have really come to take a day-to-day -day role in commerce there. Um, and it's provided people with a great deal of economic freedom that they just didn't have before. Uh, another example is Klarna out of um, Scandinavian countries. Um, Klarna is a company that allows, that uh, really took advantage of the culture there, which is that people didn't, it, it's very much a cash-based economy. Uh, people don't take, use credit um, and they don't like to pay for things before they receive them. And so Klarna introduced a payment method where uh, only after you receive the goods from an e-commerce order do you get to pay uh, or do you have to pay. So you basically get a grace period. And that was very popular there. It's also very popular in Germany, which has a similar type of culture, a very conservative uh, culture. And uh, now they're spreading to other countries like the UK and attempting to enter the US market. Um, and that was very successful in that region, but it probably isn't gonna work as well in other regions. Um, there's example after example where there are different paths to entering the market in different regions, and you really have to tailor something specific to that market um, and uh, offer both merchants and consumers a value proposition. And that's hard to do to get both sides to, to create that. But the, the types of things that resonate really consistently is lower transaction fees for the merchant um, and uh, rewards for the consumer. If you do those two things, um, you have a much better chance of success. Um, and I found that most of these that, that are successful usually do it within a very closed geographic area or a very closed uh, marketplace where um, buyers and sellers can easily find each other. It's really tough to do just entering a giant new market uh, without that element in place because it's really tough right now, taking Bitcoin as an example, of being able to find a merchant that accepts Bitcoin but if you integrate that into your product and make it easy for people to find, uh, then you're gonna give people more options and more utility of using it as a service. And same thing with the merchants, you're bringing them customers that they otherwise might not get. If you can bring merchants incremental sales at a lower transaction fee and a higher conversion rate, when people get to that checkout page, you're gonna do well hands down, you're going to do well. And so those are the things we're focused on. I don't think you're seeing other cryptocurrencies focus on, well, what are the manners in which we can increase the conversion rate when people check hit the checkout page? They're focused on, you know, creating absolutely perfect uh, uh, privacy features. And they're interested in creating, um, you know, uh, increased block capacity and things that just customers don't care about. Those are not things that are going to drive adoption. An, a full block size and will create a poor experience and will create a barrier to adoption, but it's not creating any type of incentive if you fix that. And so they're, they're fixing problems, they're not creating solutions. And that's what I think is the difference between Dash and virtually everything else that's, that's out there in the cryptocurrency space. Um, you're not, they're, they're fixing problems as opposed to coming up with the solution. It's an interesting way to put it. So I would like to shift gears a little bit and ask you a bit about 
what it is that you do in particular for Dash, especially when it comes to you've often been called the director of finance. And it's true, uh, so many of Dash's treasury proposals uh, are proposed by you, uh, go through you, and then are divvied out to, to the subcontractors whom you oversee, or at least whom you uh, facilitate payment for. Is that something that, is that an idea that you came up with? Uh, or is that something that it seems like people were coming to you saying, hey, I want to do some work, Ryan, give me some money. And you thought, my goodness, uh, maybe it's more efficient if I am simply uh, the distributor here rather than these people making all their own proposals. Yeah. So when I uh, first start, started talking with Evan about coming on full time, what I didn't want to do was come on full time without a clearly defined role. Um, and a purpose for being there. Um, and I, I think I was the one that proposed uh, leading the finance function. And the reason I did that is because I, I think we were very reactive at the time. Uh, we would see an opportunity or identify a need that had to be filled. And then someone on the team would, would put a proposal in for it. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of planning ahead for what comes next, what comes three, four months down the road. If the budget increases, how would we spend it? And so it really put us on our back heels oftentimes because there either wasn't enough money in the budget for something that we needed this month. Uh, so we had to forego a conference or something like that. And then the next month there'd be this gaping hole that you know there was no use for. And so I said, you know, one of the things that would add a lot of value to the project straight off the bat is being able to plan ahead, know what uh, costs are coming, prioritize those against criteria like how much of an impact can it have, how aligned with our strategy is it, um, how quickly will we receive the benefits and therefore have that compound into our budget next month. And by getting all of these ideas out on the table, prioritizing them, and then managing that through, we started getting a lot more value out of the budget that was available. And we could plan ahead for an expense that we knew, knew was coming in three months, a conference that was coming up. And by doing so, even get lower costs on you know, our travel and, and hotels and things like that. And so uh, I saw that as hugely valuable. Now, as I got into the job, I realized that a huge part of this is figuring out, well, what are our strategic priorities? How are we going to um, you know, manage bringing more people on and the resources we need? Which resource is more important given a constrained budget? And you know, naturally, I think any fi in any finance organization, um, in any, embedded within any organization, you're having to reach out to literally every area of the organization and gather the necessary information and then facilitate getting everybody on the same page as to how that's going to uh, be spent and benefit the organization and so on. And so um, it really turned into a much uh, broader exercise around just, you know, keeping all of these different moving parts on the same page. And, um, and so I, I think uh, at this point, I'm, I'm stretching myself. We, we had a strategic plan that was really meant to take us from up to around one or $200 million. And at, that, at this point, we've, we obviously quickly moved past that so, so fast that um, we're a little bit back on our heels again and having to, to do the next planning that gets us to a billion. I remember something like three or four months ago, it was the first time that more proposals were put in than we had treasury funds to pay out for, or maybe more were approved than we had treasury yeah. funds to pay out for. And you left a comment somewhere that said something like, this is not a problem. This is what causes us, what, which, this is what forces us to prioritize our resources. And, and that I thought that was really neat. And, and obviously, uh, everything you, you have proposed thus far has been to the majority of the master nodes liking because, you know, even in the months where there has been more competition than we could afford to pay out, 
uh, your proposals continue to be paid out? Well, I, I, I certainly would love to be able to take credit for that, but um, you know, the core team uh, really, I think, has earned a lot of respect and um, trust more than anything from uh, the masternode owners as we continue to deliver. Um, you know, I, I certainly can't speak for everyone, uh, but I oftentimes get messages from folks that say, you know, hey, you guys are doing a really fantastic job, and you know, I I, I have a lot of faith in in virtually everything that you 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 guys pursue. Not everything is going to be successful, but you know, uh, I support you, and and so I think that you're seeing a bit of that come out. The more the more we build a track record of performance, and the more that we build a track record of delivering on on the things that we say, uh, for the most part. Um, I think that you're you're seeing that reflected in the votes, and I think that same opportunity is available to any uh, DAO or contractor that comes along and wants to serve the network. I think it's tougher when you first start out, and I think as you build a reputation and uh, build a track record and history with the network, uh, you do gain those the trust of the network um, and and gain additional support and maybe even leeway to say. You know what? Trust me on this. This is really important for what we're trying to do as part of our overall strategy, and so um, I think that that is a natural outcome and and one that is healthy and, and good for the network is to have uh, different contractors that have a track record with the network that can be more more trusted with these funds, and so um, yeah, I think I think it's been an interesting. Uh, an interesting evolution in terms of the way we work to, um, you know, having individuals each learning how to do a proposal and, and uh, how to do it efficiently and um, how to, how to uh, present them to the community and so on. We're specializing in different tasks. Our developers should be focusing on development and our folks doing international outreach should be focusing on international outreach. And so, uh, by taking the reins on the proposals um, and taking that off their plate, they're able to focus on their jobs and, and uh, I'm able to focus on getting those through in a, a pretty efficient manner. So um, yeah, I, I think that there's there's a few things that we've done to, to kind of help and, and make it make it better. Well, Brian, do you have any final comments? that you would leave us with if, if, if you wanted to, if you had one. Well, uh, so tomorrow, we, uh, by the time this airs, it will already have occurred, but tomorrow we're going to be hosting our, um, our quarterly call. It will be available, recorded, and I would encourage folks to come check it out because we'll, we'll give a lot more detail on, on what we're doing. But I think for me, the top level message for that call is my how things have changed over the course of the last couple of months. We seem to be pretty stable uh, in the 40 to $45 range, um, uh, which is a huge jump from where we were even a month or two ago. And that is essentially two to three times growth. And deploying those ki kinds of resources efficiently and for the, the maximum benefit of the network is going to be difficult to do. I think that, you know, it's hard to grow quickly and efficiently at the same time, but we're going to do our best um, to deploy those resources as efficiently as we can. The thing that we're struggling with more than anything right now is growth and uh, adjusting our planning for this new level. Um, but it's going to allow us to do a lot more than I think most people realize at this point. Um, when you put pen to paper and start to realize the kind of firepower we now have to go after growing our ecosystem, hiring people, and compensating people well to attract and keep good talent, um, I think that we're going to see uh, another huge change in the project this year that's going to allow us to to make the next big leap up to the billion dollar mark at some point, um, probably quicker than most people ha realize it's gonna happen. That's my prediction. I made some pretty bold predictions at the beginning of the year with triple digit growth and at least number four by the end of the year, but 
we passed that so quickly, I have to be more bold. Ryan Taylor and the rest of the Dash Core team hold a quarterly report call for investors to listen to as well as ask questions. Click here to view the most recent of such calls, and I'll see you back here next Friday, same time, for the next Dash Detailed Spotlight.